the author thinks that things are a certain way and, and whatnot, and, and that's okay. <coughs> uh, our, our chapter this, this evening really talked pretty sternly and strongly about things. I think because of the nature of writing a book, you have to take stronger stands. And I'm, I'm just going to soft pedal that a little bit. And if you grew up on, on KJV, it's awesome, right? Because even, even the author said in our book that there's nothing, uh, there's nothing about the faith that is in jeopardy if you read the KJV. It's just there are better, more close to the original translations than we have in that now. So as we talk tonight, um, I, I want to tell you that basically the whole chapter can be summed up in telephone game versus text criticism. So, so I had to tell uh, Amando this week what the telephone game was because he's too young to know what the telephone game was. <laughs> oh, he and I were talking and I was like, hey, have you ever heard of the telephone game? And he's like, what? No. <laughs> so does anyone know what the telephone game is? Right? It's a party game where you have everybody line up if you're not familiar. Say you have 20 party guests and you tell someone or you give them a sentence that's of some length and you tell them to read it, memorize it, and then tell their neighbor. And then they tell their neighbor, and then they tell their neighbor, and then they tell all the way around to get here to the other end, right? And so it may say at the beginning, my dog has fleas, and at the end, it said, it maybe says, can I have some hamburger, please? <laughs> you know, like nothing, no relation from beginning to end. That's a telephone game. So personally, I have had someone challenge my Bible because they assume telephone game has happened with scripture, right? Right, so that there's this challenge that says, well, the original writers wrote it, but then the, whoever copied it messed it up, and then somebody messed that up, and then somebody messed that up, and before you know it, I would like some hamburger, please, comes out of, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? And so all of those copies are called manuscripts, and that is, MSS is like sort of the industry standard um, military way to say it. Manuscripts, three letters, you know how military likes acronyms or whatever. Well, MSS just stands for manuscripts. Manuscripts are just basically copies of the Bible, right? And the telephone game happens is because there's so many manuscripts and they're all over the place. You find them in North Africa, you find them, you know, they were, they were discovered in all different places around the Mediterranean and around the world, really. And we have the Catholic Church to thank their careful care of a lot of the manuscripts we have. Uh, the Catholic Church has preserved for Christendom all the church, us, we are inheritors of what the Catholic Church has done, which is protect all the manuscripts, the copies that they found. And so don't throw stones, because we live in a glass house, right? And, and we, we have a lot of thankfulness for how God preserved that through the Catholic Church, right? And it's not us versus them, it's us, right? So it, with, with this, we have to remember manuscripts. Manuscripts is basically... Um, Joanne decided that she wanted to be a copyist, and so she trained to be a copyist of Scripture. And so that's your main job. That's all you do all day long is you take an original or an earlier copy of Scripture and you write it carefully. And they had very, I mean, it was a science being a scribe, right? Whether it was Old Testament or New Testament, it was very careful. And so the telephone game is... It's hard to establish telephone game when, when that's uh, kind of how you're doing it because it, it's scientific from the beginning. It's careful from the beginning, right? And so our author sort of unpacks this whole idea that text criticism is a science that looks at ancient manuscripts, all these copies of the Bible, like thousands of copies of the Bible for the New Testament. And it's not necessarily all of the New Testament. It doesn't have all of Matthew all the way to Revelation. Sometimes it's just the book of John. Sometimes it's just the pastoral epistles, you know, um, that we, we have in there. Uh, 
like we read today, we read from an epistle, a pastoral epistle, uh, it maybe it's just the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but a lot of them are, are big chunks of New Testament, right? Uh, and until, you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Did you read, the, you read about the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? The DSS uh, in, the, in the text this week? The Dead Sea Scrolls were a late discovery, right? A little boy who was goat herding, and you know what little boys love to do when they're in a, in a field full of rocks? They like to pick up rocks, and they like to throw rocks. I, have a, I had a little boy. My little boy loved to throw rocks. Asked my wife about a certain antique mirror one time. <laughs> so he threw a rock and heard something go, because he threw it in a cave. This is literally how they were discovered. And there was this whole group of, of Jews who were sort of separating themselves and were living sort of a monk lifestyle. And all they did was care for scripture and copy scripture and maintain scripture. And before the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest copies of the Old Testament we had was in A.D. At, on a, whatever, the Domini or whatever, and somebody might know that better, but after Jesus was on the planet Earth. It was in the Middle Ages. Isn't that what our text says? It was, you know, 1200s, which it was a culmination of older copies that we don't really have copies of, but we have the collection of them called the Masoretic Text, which is the Old Testament. And so we had the Masoretic Text. And one of the things that people who challenged the validity and the reliability of Scripture said was that the telephone game happened. Because when you read in passages of Isaiah, the suffering servant, you know those passages, Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 40 and some of those in there, there's no way it could have been that specific to Jesus. It was written into Isaiah after Jesus was here. And so then it made everyone think, well, there were prophecies about this Jesus, Jesus guy. So, But when that little boy threw that rock, that moved us from 1200 A.D. to 300 B.C. Before Christ, or BCE, or whatever you want to call it, it's funny, they want to use different letters, but it's still the same start. It's surrounded Jesus. So anyway, so 300 BC to 1280, how many years is that, Matt Wizzes? Last time I checked, that's like 1500 years. We moved back 1500 years in, in copies of the Old Testament. And if the telephone game were actually what was happening, then if we took the Masoretic text, which was in 1280, and we held it up against 300 BC, what should we find? A lot of differences. They pulled up Isaiah, and they looked at it, and guess what it did? It lined, that baby lined up. 1,500 years of copying. Why is it that accurate? Because Joanne's good at what she does. <laughs> That's, that's the copyists. That's why the telephone game doesn't work. Are there differences? Yes. There are what they call variants. Did you read the word variants in your text and wonder what is that? That means that this copy and this copy have a difference. That's what a variance is. It's a variant, right? Um, Marvel's using variant now a lot in their multiverse if you're a Marvel person at all. But that's offshoots, okay? So if you're reading 1 Corinthians 13 and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, this 1 Corinthians 13 and this manuscript doesn't follow exactly in this 1 Corinthians 13, what do we have going on? We have a variant. They're, they don't agree. And so because we have so many copies, so many manuscripts, we can take a bunch of them and look and sort of start lining them up and seeing, okay, how many of these have that same variant? How many of these manuscripts have the same variant? And how many are don't? And because text criticism is basically, it, when you think this, this is just Bible science. Does that help you? Text criticism is Bible <laughs> science. Basically, it's scientific approach to try to figure out what did the original copy of this say, because we don't have the original, right? When John was writing his gospel that we are studying in big church right now, 
on Sunday morning. We don't have the one that he did in his handwriting, right? We don't have that one. But we have, John's gospel actually is, it, we have the oldest manuscripts that are the closest to the original writing. Right now, I think we're within 35 years of when John penned the gospel of John. Does that give you chills? That gives me chills. Because the dirt is giving up its secrets and it's proving our faith. It, archaeology proves our faith. Because the Bible talks about true things, not just about um, when a king lived or whatever, but what Jesus said about himself, how the way to heaven works, all of that. It's true. It's true. It's true. And if, if you're coming to a time where you're doubting that, just remember this class of this day. Pastor Tom said that the Bible is true because it's reliable. We can rely on it. And 30 years or so within the writing, the manuscripts we have, partial copies of the Gospel of John, there's no room for that telephone game. And the science of text criticism is careful study, careful study of all those manuscripts. And what the author basically spends a lot of time saying is that there's external evidence, and there's internal evidence. External evidence simply means how good are the copies and how close to the original writing are they? So how, how much telephone game could have happened? You know, we're finding them closer and closer all the time. And, and so uh, external evidence, how good are the copies that, where we found this? Because there are areas of the world, like did you, did, I think it says it's in North Africa, I don't know if it's, it's in North Africa where the best copies of the New Testament are. There was a library there and they were carefully copying scripture way, way back to when the New Testament was being formed, being written. And so there are certain areas where there are better copyists and they have less variance, right? So there's less, they, they line up better and they're more careful, Joy was more careful in North Africa than she was around into uh, um, Upper Galatia or Turkey. Sorry, you were just better in, in Africa. So, so the external evidence, right? And then there's the internal evidence of how, how do they, how, how many variants are there and how much does, does uh, this manuscript that I'm looking at right now, whatever one it is, of the 5,000, um, how, how much does it um, move towards the original? We can use the science of text criticism to figure out which ones are closer to the original copy that John wrote. Am I, am I making sense? Does that make more sense than the text? Are you glad you came? <laughs> Praise God, right? So there's these external evidences. How close are they? Like, when was it written? based on when the original was, and where was it written, uh, what language was it in, uh, so, so that sort of thing. Uh, but the Old Testament is interesting. Did you notice a word called the Septuagint? Yeah. So, yeah, that's the Septuagint. Basically, that is a Greek copy of the Old Testament. It's, it's in Greek. And it goes back to right around 200 B.C., and that before we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's what we were using to try and make sure what we had in the Old Testament in the Masoretic text, which was the 1200 AD copy, how close was it? And so um, there's another thing. We have another language we can compare. If we find a, a, a Hebrew or Aramaic word in the Old Testament that we're not sure what it means, we can look and see what they did for translation into the Greek. Because we have a little bit more, uh, actually a lot more understanding of, of ancient Greek than we do ancient Hebrew in many ways. So, um, how many copies, how close to the original, and then how, how, uh, or how many variants are in there? That's text criticism. That's not, that's not suggestion, that's science, okay? And so, it's very interesting to me, just from a practical standpoint, the amount of challenges that the world has for the Bible. And they say, well, it's, you just you have blind faith. Well, based on this, you think we have blind faith? I, I don't think so either. I think our faith is informed. And 
it mattered to people that you and I have the copy uh, of Scripture that John, I mean, it's as close as we can get to how John wrote. Now let's get into just, I'm going to take five minutes of your time and I'm not going to charge any extra. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a bit about the different translations, right? And if you turn on, is it on page 40? What is it? Let me look at my notes. Where that table is and it gives you all of those different translations and where they fit. Thank you, 45. I, I, we need each other. <laughs> and so you see how on the left it's more, they, they use the word literal. And then as you move over, it's more dynamic on to the right side uh, of where the translations fit. Now, how many of you would, would say, well, you want more literal, right? But, but before you read the text, would you say you want more literal? Before you read chapter 2, would you say, we want more literal? Yeah, what do you think now? We need, we need a little bit of both. But you'll notice that there was a quote by the author that I absolutely agree with. Um, when you're trying, this, I wrote a note for myself, the author favors English over the original language when making a translation choice. So you're trying to translate from the original language. If you go with the literal wording, and there's some examples they give of the coals. Do you remember that? He's talking about live coals and how that actually can confuse if you go with the literal. So the, he's using French as an example. Maison, I can't speak French, but you got to almost choke when you speak French. Maison Blanc, however you say that, and that means house white. And if you were to literally translate it, you would say house of white, right? And that's why literal translations don't necessarily do us a good service. We need to when you move from the original language into the receptor language, which is English, or English, we want to better understand what does that text, what is it trying to convey to me? It's trying to convey that there's a white house, not house of white. And the more I think that we can make scripture accessible, the more we can make it readable, the more we can make it understandable, the better off we are. And so, when, it, when he's doing all of this discussion about the different methods of translation, the literal book tries to, like the NASB, I have an NASB. I use an NASB when I'm studying for, for a sermon or for a teaching. I use the NASB for tonight. I'll use it, but I'll also use three or four other translations, including the New Living Translation. So as on the literal side, the NASB keeps original word order. Like, you read the word order in the Greek, and you'll see the same word order in, in the NASB. That does a disservice to English, but a service to Greek. <coughs> it, it's less understandable. It's more confusing. Is it, is it wrong? No, that's not what I'm saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm saying you, you're hearing me say that there's a difficulty that we have to overcome when we have a literal translation, but we need those. We want to have that as a comparison. How is the NASB translating this passage of, of, of 2 Timothy that we just read? All scriptures got breathed. Did you notice how different the New Living Translation was from your translation? It's different. I like it because when you read it, it's more understandable. It brings out the nuances of the text. It's doing more translation for you, but that's good. But you need to read it with other things. So. Literal translation is word for word, and then you move over to the dynamic translation with the NIV and the NLT. Um, the NIV did a sentence by sentence translation, so they're trying to make sure that this sentence says what the Greek sentence says, but they don't do it literally word for word. And then the NLT moves a little more towards a more, more dynamic approach, and they take idea by idea. It, it broadens it out a little more and tries to think about what is the idea that this passage is being conveyed in the original language. Then you have paraphrases, which are the message and the living Bible. Now those I don't think you should use for, for necessarily uh, to make a decision on what you believe about a passage, but they can help inform that decision. 
you know. So those are the translation pieces that we want to think about, and that's basically what the chapter is saying. So now that I'm at the end of my lecture, we're going to go into small groups here real quick. Before we do that, does anybody have any questions beyond what I just shared that you want clarification on that you were confused by? Based on chapter two, yes. When they speak of con uh, convenience, does that apply? Does that play a role in when they talk about conjecture for translation purposes? Yes. Yeah. When it, it's that, and then you talk about in the section where it's like, okay, this isn't exact science. Is that the section you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. They, they, they just go, well, we think it means this. You do your best. Yes. So it, yes, and that's why most of those that take. Our best guess, you'll see a note in the text at the bottom of your Bible, and there'll be some other information there about the, the passage. So when do they apply convenience to that translation? How do you how do you know when they conveniently through with this versus <laughs> by looking at several translations? Honestly. What and, and that's the difference, I think, that thank you for reminding me. So I can get there quicker because I know the original languages. I don't have Hebrew as well. Hebrew is a weird language. But I have my Greek. I still, I still read from the original Greek, Koine Greek, New Testament, when I'm preparing a message. What that allows me to do is to get there a little quicker than if someone took four translations and was looking at how these four translations were doing something with the passage. You can get to the same place I do. It's just a different path, and mine's a little shortcut. But it's worth that kind of look. You'll, yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, I is that a is that a legitimate answer to your question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. Anybody else? There are no dumb questions. All right. So we're gonna break into small groups. Um, I don't want you to be in the same group you were last week. <laughs> So, everybody who was born in an odd month, stand up. Anyone born in an odd month, stand up. Eleven. November is odd. I, too, am, I'm November. So, all right, so let's have... Four ladies here, um, and then starting with Peggy, let's come around here, and you, you two go with those three right there. And so then let's have let's have Where this yeah the library, which is across. We need to get the library ready. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. So you guys across the hall and right down there, you see the library sign. There's a table in there. So you five. Peggy, yes, all the way through here, out that door to the left. And then this group here, yeah, you guys can go together as a husband and wife, that's okay. And then you can go, go to this room behind us. You guys can go on the stage room that's right back here. Okay, and then you guys can be together, that's fine, I won't split you up. Yeah. So then you guys want to go to the bridal room, and then who's, who's got a February birthday? Any Februarys? Who is that? Eric, you want to go with them to the bridal room? Which is across the hall, straight across here. All right. Uh, you're going to the bathroom, and you're going to the bridal room. Yeah. Or no. January is an odd month. Yeah, so you guys, you guys are with them. You guys want to find a spot over there, or where did I tell you? Yeah. Are you wide? Go with that. Go with Corey. Back there. So I'll turn the lights on back there. We're supposed to go back there. Oh, Michelle. You two guys want to go, go this come over here to this <laughs> table here. and greet them, yep, and hang out with them. Uh, you guys want to move <laughs> your table to kind of that back corner over there? Or so we have room and then not on top of each other? Okay. No. 
Okay, how does a translator start a new translation? Funny thing, when I was at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois, while I was there back in the 90s, <laughs> um, I had the privilege of watching my professors, a bunch of them were on the translation committee that was formed, that's how it starts, there's a translation committee, a group of scholars gets together from hither and yon, and they start discussing <coughs> their method of translation. How are they going to approach the original languages? There's years of discussion that went into uh, the new translation that they were working on. It just so happens that they are working on the new living translation. Uh, one of my professors that um, I taught me exegesis, we talked about exegesis last time, that's learning the original meanings of the words and the passages. He, he was my exegesis professor. He was working on um, several of the New Testament books translating for the New Living Translation. Um, several of the professors there were also working on them. So I watched, um, I watched them uh, really work hard at that. It was, it was a lot of groundwork that goes into translation. And, uh, and, and their approach was to try and make scripture more approachable, more understandable. Um, and so that, 
they would sit in committees and talk about how you know a, a particular <coughs> a couple of professors would work on Galatians, and they would come with their translations, and then the committee would rake them over the coals over their translations, and so it's agonizing. Burning coals. Yeah, burning coals. Right, a lot of coals. <laughs> Yeah. Which, yep. So, was it always odd numbers? Was it there's always these on one side or another? No, or? there's there's always a strong majority. It's never that I know of. I don't know of one that was like fifty one percent. Those are the ones you're talking about. Like the we're just gonna have to give our best guess. Those are very few, but they happen. And the more more of the discussion ends up that how are we going to put the note at the bottom? On, on this particular passage. One of those is uh, when Paul talks about women are saved through childbirth. So what do you do with someone who is unable to have children or doesn't have children or whatever? And can that really mean that? And how do we translate that? And that's an important thing, isn't it? And so they, there's men and women who are smarter than all of us here get together and try to figure that out. And and it, I think it's more of how do we, how do we Decide on one first, yes, but then how do we give alternatives down in the notes? Like if you look in your Bible, you'll see a, a letter or an asterisk or something, and then you look down and you see your verse, and there's, well, there's an alternate understanding of that passage. <coughs> there's another way to translate that. And, and so they usually, the two leading ones that has the supermajority are both either in the main text or in the note. So. Can you explain that? Women sit being saved through childbirth? Yeah, no, there's, there's, I, I don't have a good enough answer that I can say that I can definitively, I'm glad that that's not a verse based on whether or not you're going to heaven. It's not, that's not what it's saying, I can say that, that's it. That's not salvation. Oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, everyone's looking at me, I'm supposed to know that now. <laughs> Yeah, Wayne probably knows. No, I was going to oh. ask him. You have a follow-up question? No, I was going like to ask him. I don't know about, uh, we had a friend that was a missionary, and he went to Africa and translated the Bible into a, from a language that was not written at all. And, and he said that the first thing you got to do is you've got to uh, convert one of the native speakers that speaks English into a Christian. And then when you're making the translation, then you'll be able to go through and say, oh, that's nice, and it's pretty funny. That isn't what that means at all. You know, the way you've written it, you know, it's, it's you know, what we've been talking about here. You know, yeah. You know, so you have a native speaker who can tell you, nice try, but no. Yeah, and I, I think it's important that, again, it's Bible science that goes into translation. Um, I, I just, I, I've said it multiple times because I get really frustrated by those who would challenge that the Bible is just a willy-nilly telephone game. And it's, it's not. It's careful, thoughtful, years of study, and archaeology, and all that good stuff, uh, study that goes into translation. And, and um, I want you to walk with your head held high with the fact that your Bible tells you the truth about what God's Word says. So, and praise God for Wycliffe and their, their time. Taking the Scripture, the words of Scripture, and bringing it to indigenous languages. It's amazing. Yes? Can you ever separate the Scripture from the culture in which it was written? Can you ever separate the scripture from the culture from which it was written? There is going to be a, I think, yes and no. <laughs> there is going to be a supracultural truth. God is God. There is only one God. Okay. Explain to me what is supra. Okay. Supra means 
above all culture and applies to every culture. Supracultural means it doesn't matter what, whether you're in Africa or you're in South America or wherever you are, there's eternal truths that apply that aren't cultural. They are above culture. That, that's the way to put it. But, so this is, this is getting us into, we have to admit that God accommodated himself. He is holy and other and transcendent and all of these majestic words. He is so not like us. And then he became like us. And Jesus was the physical representation and manifestation of God, right? How does that work? Explain it to me. Right? Right? He was fully God, he was fully man. What does that mean? Uh, all I can tell you is that anytime, often, I, I just, I've never seen it, an exception. When you find a paradox, like Jesus was fully God and he was fully man, when you find that paradox that's un ir irreconcilable, you know you're at the truth. Because it, a powerful God can only do that. And, and there, we have to understand that we will eventually move into mystery and faith, right? But let's be educated as far and as deep and as well as we can until we raise our hands in praise and say, God, you are bigger than me and I can't understand fully, but thank you for giving me enough, right? And that's where the, that's where the challengers to the faith who want to say we play the telephone game with scripture, they apply rules of certainty that they don't apply to their own selves. And it's more, I think, someone who is challenging the Bible on those terms is more about their own will. I will not believe than I cannot believe because there's not enough evidence. You still understand what I'm saying, the differences there? And so I will not believe, is, is, that's your volition. I mean, that's your will saying, no, God. I will not, versus I can't because I don't have enough information. There is enough information for anyone to believe. Even, even the worst sinner, Judas, had he allowed the truth to penetrate his heart, it, it would have changed him. But he said no. And so translation is accommodation. Like we, God had to use human language to tell us about himself. He accommodated eternal truths into our language. Into, and, and think about your, if you're married, how much does your own language and your ability to express yourself to your spouse fall short? <laughs> and you're speaking the same language. You're, sp you're both native speakers of the same language, most likely. Maybe not, but think about how much that is a challenge. And, and guys are going, man, women speak a different language. I don't know what they speak, but it's not my language. I don't get it. Right? And so if that's hard, how much harder is it for God to be wholly other, completely perfect, transcendent, meaning way out there, not, not us, for him to speak truths about himself? And when you and I read the pages of Scripture and we're moved by the Holy Spirit and we're, our, our, our hearts are cemented into truth and we, we, we can tell we're standing more firm uh, and more, more uh, confident in our faith as we read his word. So it's important to know that there's accommodation happening there, but the, the God who made that word is always at work through the word. Right? And so... Is it the actual words of Scripture, or is it the God who is in the midst of that word? And that's where I think it is. And that's why we have such a powerful witness. And the, the texts that we have, the Bibles that we have, are, they, they are so powerful in our lives because of the Spirit. Even though we've done our best to find all the manuscripts and do the best translations, so when it comes down to it, there is the ultimate X factor that is the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. So, um, and so now can we talk a little bit as we, any other questions? I don't want to, I'll, I'll short myself. First Timothy 2.15. That's, yeah. We, we got it up here. I should have said it. Thank you. Saved by childbirth. I'll do my best to do, to look it up in hard sayings and see what, what it says there. But man, there's, it's just 
anybody that studied it is just going to go, well, this is my best guess. Uh, you know, it's, it, we're going to do the convenient thing. Because that's all we can do. All, all, all I can say is maybe that, that's where they came up with baptism for the dead. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right? Well, I just, I feel confident in saying what it is not. And that's what I was saying, trying to say to Peggy. I know it's not salvation. salvation. That's not what it's saying. I know that for a fact. Because it contradicts too much of other scripture. Yeah, Michelle. The Bible is infallible. That's kind of what I actually was saying about the Holy Spirit. Um, so, since humans are involved in translation, there's going to be translations are going to fall short at times. We're going to do our convenient best guess. But the thing that makes it infallible is the part where I was saying that the Holy Spirit was at work. And I was, tr I was trying to answer that question. Um, but didn't refer to it exactly, so you're smarter than I am on that one. Thank you for... Because that's the answer to that question, I think. What makes it infallible is the work of the Holy Spirit in the midst of His Word. So, yes? So we look at the definition of the word infallible. Yeah. And it's in favor of what makes it a sin for error. Yeah, because of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yep. Amen. So, if you looked on your app... I posted a bunch of resources this last week, one of which was the Blue Letter Bible. Um, that, that is an excellent website and app. You can download that on your phone. There are a lot of resources on the Blue Letter Bible. My wife's going, yep. Uh, I put on there, what else did I put on there? I put on there the Bible Gateway. So if you want to look at four translations all at once, the Bible Gateway will allow you to do that. You can pull up a passage you're studying and pull up, you can pull up 17 versions if you want. And it's BibleGateway.com, that's in there, right? Um, and the Heart Sings Bible, our book, I put in there. Um, I will always try to do, Peggy was pointing this out, you know, hey, it's cheaper here or there. I always try to give you the cheapest way to get it to you, but sometimes those move up. I would just always say check CBD because <coughs> The, the Bible that I put in there is the one that I'm going to recommend that if I had to have only one Bible, this is exactly how uh, Daryl Daryl yeah. was asking me this. If you had one Bible and you could only have one and that's all you could read, what would it be? It would be the New Living Translation. Because then it would be easier for me to hand it to somebody who is a new believer and say, here, you can borrow my Bible for a while. And th this, this is a translation, it's not a paraphrase. There's a difference. Paraphrase is not the same. You know, it's, that's why it's the, the Living Bible is way on the right side of that table on page 45, right? Yeah. So, New Living Translation, but I would, the one I put in here is the Filament Bible. This is the Filament New Living Translation. What does that mean? That means that it comes with an app. And if I were reading out of the book of 1 Kings, chapter 12, I would open my app and scan the page number, and the app would pull up all of the Bible characters that are on that page, all of the background story that's on that page, all of, if you're familiar with the Bible Project, right? The Bible Project is an excellent resource. I haven't put it out there yet, but it's going to go up on our resources page. It's a YouTube channel put out where maybe you've watched it. It gives you, like, if you want to know what was the book of First Kings all about, they do a YouTube video that tells you all about what the book of 1 Kings is all about. When you're going to read a book of the Bible, I highly recommend you refer to the Bible Project's YouTube page on that book. So you scan this page number with the app, and it would bring up the Bible Project's 1 Kings. It would talk about, um, there's uh, in the Bible Project, they have, what do you do when you're reading narrative? This is narrative. First Kings is, is, is a narrative book. It's just basically telling you the story. So when you're reading narrative, they, they have a Bible um, narrative um, video. Uh, there are some um, sermons that pull up in the, in the Philemon Bible of people who have uh, preached on that passage. And you can read their sermons. I, whenever someone comes to Christ, and I wish it were more often in my life than it is, but when they do, I give them a filament Bible, and I, with them, download the app, and then there's a, 
logo on the front of the app right here that you have to scan with the app, which opens the app up. And basically, the, the, the app is trying to say, do you really have a filament Bible? Because then I'll work. <laughs> right? And so I, I highly recommend if I only had one Bible, and, and the reason is, is because the NLT is the most approachable and understandable version that I have found. Does that mean I hate NASB or ESB? ESB maybe I hate. No, just kidding. <laughs> so this isn't going to work because I have that Bible. You have to have a filament Bible. That you bought in the store. <laughs> I put it on our resources page. It's on, uh, it's on sale with CBD right now for $13.99. And it's a leather light. It's not actual leather. But that is a steal of the price. And it's... Yeah, not chewables. That's, that's a cultural reference. It stands for Christian Book Distributors. It's cbd.com. It's not chewables. That's embarrassing. Your, your work, co-worker looks over your shoulder and you're typing in cbd.com. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I see how it is. Um, so, does anyone have the resources page up? Have I forgotten anything? I, I think I put five things up. Keep an eye on that because it's going to be websites. It's going to be okay. Readers. <laughs> so yeah, I've got uh, Bible Gateway, Blue Letter, this discussion questions. Hard. Yep, they're all there. So keep an eye on the resources page. I will always be putting things in there. Um, if you find a good resource, let me know. Or if you're concerned about a good resource. Uh, ask me. I'll try to do my work on and uh, figure out whether it's a good resource or not. All resources are not created equal. Uh, and I, I, if I stepped on your toes because you grew up with King James and it's near and dear to your heart, I, I humbly apologize. It was not my intention. But there are better translations out there now. That's what I'm trying to say. I was rehearsing what I said and I think I think you might have heard something that I actually said that I want to retract. Because that's not what I was trying to say. Um, so next week, chapter 3, right? Anybody read ahead already? Good. Let's stay together. Um, you're free to read ahead. I know, Dan, you're going to read ahead. I know it. I've been around you enough now. He's on chapter 7, I bet. <laughs> Five, see? I was, I was in the right direction. Um, if you haven't got a book yet, there are, I still have a few copies up here. I ask that you just write $15 check or, or put it in an envelope and say, you know, uh, for, for the, put the book name on there. This is for hard, you know, how to read the Bible for all it's worth and then drop it in the offering box. If you're going to write a check, write it to the church and then on the, on the envelope, tell them what it's for. Um, if you can't, um, we're going to just, the church is going to shoulder that cost. If you can't afford it, don't let that stop you. Um, and, and, and if there's a resource that you really want and you can't afford it, let me know. Uh, because I want to, I just want to make sure you're not, if that's something you want to use, let's make a, we're going to make a way to get there, right? So next week, chapter three. Um, and if you have questions during the week, some of you are already using it. Who was it that was saying this is a great resource? I love this. Who said I love this app? The this is really cool. I forgot who put it up. I said something along the lines of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's really cool too because I, 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 first time I ever used one, <laughs> I never chatted before. <laughs> yeah. So I, if you haven't been on there and have seen the chat, I'm trying to answer questions as real time as I can. So. All right, it's 8.02. I took two extra minutes. I'm sorry. I'll see you next week. And we'll start uh, right at 6.30. See you then.